edition of Headline Buster in the year 2021 brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTM page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at thepointwithalex at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We live stream Headline Buster on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Beijing time and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Fridays. So do join us during the live streaming and get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. As we come to a close of the year and it's time for holidays and peace and cheer, let me tell you a story at our last headline buster of 2021 to match the festive spirit. Let's call it a tale of two elections. The first one happened in 1992. A British politician contested but lost in parliamentary elections. So did he retire from politics? Not at all. He actually got a promotion and was appointed the chief of an entire region. But mind you, there was no election in that region to see if the people there wanted him and he wasn't one of them. Would you consider the, the process democratic? Certainly not. But nobody really gave a hoot at that time. Certainly not the mainstream international media. Who was that man? It was British politician Chris Patton, who became the 28th and last governor of Hong Kong. And now we come to the second election, which is set in present times. The Hong Kong Legislative Council, or LegCo elections, held on Sunday, December the 19th. For the first time in the history of the city, all seats were contested. And the candidates ran on different platforms. 1.3 million local people cast their ballot to choose the city's 90 legislators. All this was unimaginable when the Brits were running the city. As I mentioned, the governor was appointed by the UK government and he appointed the Legislative Council members with the approval of London. It was not until 1993 that the governor no longer served concurrently as the president of the Legislative Council. Strangely, those who dictated affairs in Hong Kong are now branding themselves as guardians of democracy for the locals. They're also some of the most vocal critics of Hong Kong affairs. Were Hong Kong's former colonizers struck by lightning, which made them consider bringing democracy to the city in the early 1980s? Or was it conscience that compelled the last governor to impose an electoral reform just before Hong Kong's return to Chinese rule? No, they had more than 150 years to do that had they really cared. They knew it was impossible to keep the city in their grips, so they wanted to leave a honorable legacy. How? By making Hong Kong a semi-independent political entity. Very cunning indeed. And, as expected, right after the election results on Sunday, the UK issued a joint statement with its partners in the Five Eyes Alliance and expressed grave concern over the erosion of democracy in Hong Kong. How ironic. Well, some would say, don't compare things with those times. We have moved on. In the past 24 years, the city had elections. Why did Beijing want to make it better? Bern Bernard Chen, a former Hong Kong LegCo member, gave me his personal testimony. After what we've gone through in 2019, and even before 2019, our legislature in Hong Kong is practically in a standstill for quite some time. There's always a disagreement, and the, some of our opposition uh, legislators oppose for the sake of opposing, and, and they demonize anything that uh, has to do with the mainland of China. So, and that's not helping Hong Kong's and not helping Hong Kong's economy. I, I would assume that uh, we probably, the legislature should be back in business. Mm -hmm. We should try to focus on addressing some of the deep-rooted uh, social issues in Hong Kong. So to give you a few concrete examples, uh, Yao Wai Chin used the F word for the country of China during her oath-taking ceremony. Chen Chong Tai put the Chinese national flag and Hong Kong regional flag upside down as a way of protest. Also, at a scene from the oath-taking ceremony, Long Chong Hang carried a banner that said Hong Kong is not part of China. Would such people have been allowed to run in any other countries? Should such scenes be tolerated or even condoned in the name of democracy? 
But that's not all. According to the official tally, during the sixth LegCo term from 2014 to 2020, under the request of some members of LegCo Council, the roll call for the meetings had to be made over 500 times, taking up nearly 90 hours. That's nearly four days' time, which could have been spent on serious problem solving for the local issues. And during the previous term, it was even worse. A whopping 1,490 road calls had to be made, wasting 223 hours. During the past LegCo term, members had to be dismissed 97 times due to improper conduct. It was a higher number than 75 times in the previous time. 25 LegCo members were involved. Again, that was a historic t uh, high. Twice, some of the members throw unknown stinky objects in the council, disrupting the sessions. It's reported that at least 108 bills concerning livelihoods, including medical, traffic, elderly care and local infrastructure, were delayed over the past six years due to filibustering and other tactics deployed by some lawmakers. So, if Sunday's LegCo election was an erosion of democracy, should people return to the old days of dysfunction? Is that what democracy really means? Now let's take a look at how the mainstream international media cover the election. And the headlines, at one glance, looked starkly uniform. They could have come from the same journalists. The spotlight is, of course, on patriots. It's rather strange that anybody other than patriots should be allowed to run for public office in any country. But here, you see, patriots is almost invariably in quotation marks. What these headlines really want to tell you is that these are people loyal to Beijing or pro-Beijing in their definition. The opposition, on the other hand, is called pro-democracy. The underlying fallacy is that what aligns with Western or capitalist ideas or interests means progress and democracy, whereas China represents the opposite. But is that dichotomy true? Was the West the real champion of democracy? The British, 1980, the British 1832 Reform Act is viewed as the milestone that established parliamentary democracy in Britain, but it never crossed the minds of the British colonizers to introduce democracy in Hong Kong until in the 1980s. That's 140 years after it started annexing the city. Instead, it was the basic law of Hong Kong promulgated by the National People's Congress of China for the return of the city that set democratic elections in stone for the locals and stipulated universal suffrage as the ultimate goal. And that goal was reiterated by the central government this week. So who is really pro-democracy? Another key issue used to discredit Sunday's election is the voter turnout. The Reuters report called it a record low. In this article, it says the 30.2% turnout, about half that of, the, that of the previous poll in 2016, was seen by pro-democracy activists as a rebuke to China after it imposed a broad national security law and sweeping electoral changes to bring the city more firmly under its authoritarian grip. We've heard all of this before. By the way, is this a propaganda piece by the opposition camp or a news report by an international news agency which should be balanced and objective? Remember that this was one of the first elections held in the city, still reeling from the traumas of protracted violence and the effects of recurring pandemic. Secondly, local issues such as housing and inequality are still daunting despite reinstalled stability. It would be unrealistic to expect great enthusiasm for the elections in the first place. But what these medias don't tell you much is that in the run-up to the vote, there had been an almost concerted mobilization to sabotage the vote by those who tried to derail it in the past. What do I mean? As the election drew near, there appeared to have been a campaign to discredit it as illegitimate to turn off potential voters. Let me give you one outstanding example. Despite it being an offense to incite people to boycott the election or cast invalid votes, five criminal fugitives, including former LegCo member Nathan Law, urged voters to stay at home. Just ignore them, Law said at a public event early December. We should not give any legitimacy to the election. We should not pretend we have an election. By the way, the organizer of that event was Reuters. They could have themselves explained why voter turnout was so low.
And Law was also an invited guest to the U.S. Summit for Democracy for calling for others not to exercise their democratic rights. In the U.S., Brian Lone, who vandalized the Legislative Council in 2019, called the elections unconstitutional and illegitimate and not merit being called an election at all. Alex Chow, who was convicted in 2017 for an unlawful assembly that left 10 people injured and who is also in the U.S. now, called on people to boycott the election because it's a way to protest against the government. Does that help explain why some 2% of the votes cast on Sunday were invalid, a record high? These voices certainly did not boost voter turnout. But that's not all. These calls coincided with actions by extremist political groups which reportedly conspired to use violence during the polls. According to the South China Morning Post, a week before the voting, the police arrested 10 alleged members of a hidden group and seized more than 200 air guns, some as powerful as anti-riot shotgun. They think these guns may have been intended to disrupt the election. The Reuters article pointed out that the so-called pro-democracy candidates were largely absent, but it didn't tell you the reason. The Democratic Party, for example, chaired by Lo Chin He, did not field any candidates, and this prevented some of their supporters from voting, a result that may have been intended. Finally, stepping back, is higher voter turnout necessarily the symbol of the health of a democracy? The last U.S. presidential election witnessed a record high turnout of 67 percent. But how healthy is the U.S. democracy now? To the contrary, a member of a key CIA advisory panel said this week the U.S. is closer to a civil war than you believe. Maybe the high voter turnout was a sign of something else. It's clear, having said all of this, Hong Kong's woes are real. Although the 90 lawmakers have successfully been elected, they have to deliver. And the administration still has to channel and respond to the voices of all locals throughout its term. This is what China calls a whole process people's democracy. It doesn't stop at the polling stations. I think we have earned a break here. When we come back, we have a panel of experts and elected legislator members from Hong Kong for more on the city's democracy. Stay with us. Welcome back to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined from Hong Kong by three guests. They are Dr. Hong Wen, member-elect to the Legislative Council of uh, Hong Kong SAR, Henry Ho, founder and chairman of the One Country, Two Systems Youth Forum, and uh, Dr. Fozia Nazir Long, associate professor of the School of Law from City University of Hong Kong. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me go to Dr. Hong first, because uh, this is the first time I understand you have been running, you, that you ran yes. for the Legislative Council and you won, so congratulations. Tell us a bit about Thank yourself, you. uh, what is your background and uh, on what platform did you run? Uh, I, I, I'm a newcomer to the political uh, arena, I'm from mainland, and I'm running at the uh, election committee constituency. Actually, my key idea is the, that I found two divided Hong Kongs now. One, I call it elite Hong Kong, which is what we call the International Financial Center uh, or the super connector, but only elite can benefit from such a Hong Kong. On the other hand, we have another Hong Kong that is uh, uh, the place where middle class and the grassroots uh, 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 live, and uh, it is suffering from um, hollowing out of the industrial, uh, the unilateral uh, industrial structure and uh, uh, channel for youth to um, move up the uh, social ladder is so narrow. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I want to uh, bring to the Legislative Council is new ideas that to diversify the economic structure and bring uh, more opportunities to different people from different classes, including the middle class as well as the grassroots. 
Hmm. Um, how do you look at this kind of assumption that uh, maybe when you come from the mainland, especially when you are so supportive to the idea of integration, you know, of Hong Kong being part of China, that you are not democratic, that you are not representing the voices of grassroots people in Hong Kong? Uh, how do you react to that? Yeah, I see the opportunity come to me when the uh, central government make improvements in the election system. In the past, it's unimaginable that people like me would have a chance to become a candidate, not to mention winning the election. But now, uh, during the whole campaign process, I participated in more than 100 meetings with the voters, and I found they really listened to my platforms. They really um, concerns uh, what I bring to the uh, to the table. Mm. So we have high quality discussions on my uh, uh, manifesto, and uh, finally they 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 put trust in me. So 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 I think actually it is uh, it is. It's a very competitive campaign, and uh, it brings opportunities to newcomers like me uh, to 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 join the parliament. Um, it was very interesting for me to hear your first-hand uh, experience, of course. But let me get to our other guests uh, for their perspective. Henry, um, welcome back to the point. It's been a while. How do you look at? Yeah, how do you look at uh, the past elections and the significance of these elections for the construction, for the democratic um, politics of Hong Kong? Well, first of all, I think this is the uh, first uh, electrical election under the principle of patriots governing Hong Kong. Uh, I think there are three uh, key characteristics. First of all, is security. Um, this time we have the vetting committee, which allows only patriots to to, to join the race and thereby, you know, we will totally remove those anti-China elements or those uh, agents or foreign countries who want to disrupt Hong Kong, as we have seen in uh, in the past two or three years. And secondly, I think it's the healthy competition. Uh, before, uh, for our competition, we saw the lot of, like the election forum, there are lots of uh, 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 arguments, uh, verbal, verbal attacks. So, uh, not many candidates are really focusing on the key issues. And in particular, I think uh, most people, uh, the overly political uh, issues uh, discussed during previous election. But in this time, we have seen more healthy competition, uh, more rational debate uh, in geographical constituencies, mm -hmm. functional constituencies, mm -hmm. and even election committee uh, 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 categories. And certainly, I think uh, there is really a broad representation uh, we have seen many candidates, you know, not uh, not previously uh, seen. For example, those patriots with a Taiwanese background, uh, those uh, candidates uh, for for expatriates, but those expatriates actually they live in Hong Kong like for 30 or 40 years, and bus drivers, etc. So we are really widening the spectrum uh, of uh, of uh, participation. I think that is really positive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, looking ahead, I think. Uh, it is very good. Uh, uh, I think the election has really paved the way for our further democratic development. Let me go to Dr. Long here. Thank you very much for taking your time and joining us. What is your understanding of the different kind of uh, prospects we are looking at? Because just now during my monologue, I listed uh, a lot of the examples of the kind of disruption and dysfunctional scenes that the previous uh, legal sessions were uh, basically, you know, uh, paralyzed with. Now, with this, these electoral changes, what do you think does the future have in store for us now? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucien. Uh, I would like to clarify that I'm an international law scholar, and uh, I see uh, states as artificial constructs, which are originally to be seen as historical and cultural entities. Right, so clearly with this uh, thing in mind, it is very important when we comment on the Hong Kong, we have to understand Hong Kong's unique and complex structure that you mentioned in your monologue. And the question of universal suffrage in Hong Kong is a very complex matter. It is intertwined with international law, question of sovereignty, constitutional law, democracy issues, and also the interaction between these two aspects. 
So to appreciate the status of political reform in Hong Kong or the future, which we cannot tell at this moment in time, we'll have to wait and see what happens in the next four years. As and we have to see it as and what will happen in the future. But it is necessary to appraise it from a multidisciplinary standpoint, looking at both international law, domestic law, examining the key uh, instruments like the Sino-British Joint Declaration, also the basic law alongside the international tax. So in my view, the, the solution or the, the, the situation that we can see in the future should be, it should be based on the mutual uh, benefits rather than uh, entrenching a position point of view. This is very important first point that I would like to make. And also, like you mentioned in your monologue, that it's very important to be mindful of the history of Hong Kong and the Chinese uh, history as well. That how the Chinese during the two opium wars and the Western restrictions have actually suffered and how Hong Kong actually was um, taken away uh, from uh, mainland China. Uh, and uh, I would like to emphasize it is just not the piece of territory, but also which is uh, connected to Chinese honor. And, uh, and metaphorically, one could see it as if the baby is snatched from the motherland. And if the mother has so many children, even if uh, have more children, even if the child is snatched from the mother, it uh, will uh, be not easy for the mother. So, so what we are now seeing and I, how I see it is, is that we are seeing a resumption of uh, Hong Kong uh, into the Chinese system. And there will be teething problems uh, that will occur. And we have to wait and watch uh, what will happen in the future. But we have to be mindful that whatever is happening is under the uh, basic law, is within the purview of basic law, it's within the purview of the Sino-British Declaration. Mm -hmm. So everything that is um, given uh, in an incremental way to Hong Kong, which uh, Hong Kong never actually had complete uh, universal suffrage, you know, mm -hmm. it's a process. And I think that the people need to be mindful of that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much from those uh, multidisciplinary academic background which is very, and historical perspective, which is very important. Uh, we have just uh, received some comments. Let's take a look at one of them. Yes, for instance, uh, this comment from commentator T says, democracy means by the people, for the people, not other people, for other people. The word patriot is perfect. Yes, um, this is one comment. It's, it's interesting, <laughs> Dr. Hong, um, as someone who actually ran for the council, uh, for the leg legislative council, how do you look at your role as a legislative council? And uh, really, does the idea of being a patriot limit your capacity to supervise, for instance? the administration, you know, to, to, to supervise, the, to come up with different opinions and to maybe challenge as well, to suggest, right? Does the word patriot bind you in terms of uh, how to exercise to the extreme your responsibility as a legislator? Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, some might argue that patriots administering Hong Kong will mean no meaningful scrutiny of the governance. I am afraid I cannot agree with that. Actually, parliamentary scrutiny is for promoting good governance in Hong Kong, serving the public interest in a better way. So I just cannot see why patriots could not exercise, exercise parliamentary scrutiny. That should be a basic duty of the legislature. And um, I think after taking office, I wish I could promote a new form of scrutiny. Um, I myself call it uh, constructive scrutiny, which means I don't simply seek, uh, uh, criticize the government, but more importantly, I will provide uh, better alternatives or solutions for them for reference. So we will try our best to work with the government and the bird better serve Hong Kong citizens. So I think um, actions and the results speak, that is, and uh, um, my uh, response to the criticism. 
Okay, uh, we have just time to squeeze in another comment. Let's take a look so that uh, more of the voices of our viewers can be reflected. Okay, from Han Tua, they continue to dumb down their own citizens with fake news and lies resulting in their own citizens being brainwashed. The assault on the Capitol Hill is the end result of being manipulated. Uh, Henry, uh, I want to go to you for your comments on this. Keep it brief, uh, please. Yeah, exactly. You know, this idea, if you are running the Western style of democracy, you are pro-democracy. If you're running the Chinese way, you are anti-democracy. Well, I think, I think uh, now we have seen more clearly the limits or the loopholes of the Western style democracy uh, in societies which are already very fragmented, like the U.S., so if you are getting 51% vote, uh, you may, you know, as well, you know, not offend uh, the, the rest of the population, the other 49%. That's why I think in Hong Kong, the new model of democracy are uh, really inclusive. In particular, the new election committee sector, which uh, Dr. Wendy Hong, you know, came from, uh, they are looking more at the overall Hong Kong interest and also supplement the uh, local concerns and also functional or sectoral concerns. So I think we can really see that, mm. you know, these are real improvements of okay. Hong Kong uh, electoral system. All right. Uh, finally, uh, I go to Dr. Long once again and try to keep the answer brief. Uh, however, there are a lot of uh, problems with how Hong Kong is governed at this moment. And there are a lot of people in the traditionally opposition camp which do not run for whatever consideration, but they might not have been extremists, they might not have been secessionist, they just didn't run for whatever reason, maybe the threshold was too high or they wanted to wait and, and see. So how can their contribution be potentially brought out to, to help improve the, 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 the diversity of opinions and, and improve governance eventually? Uh, well, it is a very difficult um, question to, to respond to. I mean, I really do not know why they did not, um, you know, uh, participate. But from what I read and hear is that uh, they actually uh, were criticisms um, uh, on uh, the fear that, you know, vetting the candidates uh, process will actually uh, make them, uh, you know, not be able to participate uh, and other concerns that they may have. They also uh, contended that, you know, restrictions in a candidate selection uh, and wetting is not within the universal suffrage or, you know, uh, it is not within enshrined in the, uh, the basic law. But I think that it is not to be forgotten that, uh, you know, for Hong Kong for 155 years was a colony and it came back to uh, China under the joint declaration. And it is very clearly mentioned there. there there's one country, two system. So, so the country has to be put together. So this is very important. I, I think that given time when, uh, when we have the legislators like uh, Ms. Hong, others, you know, they work for the betterment of the people and people need to see uh, that, uh, you know, there is, uh, it is very genuine. Uh, it is only a fair that is in their mind. Yeah. Thank you. Indeed, time is running short for this edition, but uh, uh, your duty, uh, Dr. Hong, as an elected uh, member of the LegCo has just started with, together with all the other 89 members. So a lot of uh, hard work ahead. Uh, congratulations once again, but uh, you know, bravo, and uh, we look forward to seeing you deliver on the promises you made to your constituencies. With that, we come to the end of uh, this uh, edition of Headline Buster. Many thanks to Dr. Hong Wen, to Henry Ho, and to Dr. Fozia Nazir Long. And many thanks to the, uh, all those who have been watching this Headline Buster. From, uh, uh, from me, Liu Xin, here is, uh, yeah, as this is the last uh, Headline Buster of the year, thank you so much for having been with us throughout this time. Uh, the warmest greetings, seasonal greetings from Beijing to you wherever you are. And we'll see you once again in the beginning of a new year. Thank you so much and bye-bye. And uh, you've bye -bye. got the point.